Professor Andrew Phelps join us um, for um, a seminar about um, his research. Um, he is a professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology in the great state of New York in the United States. And um, I've known Andy for several years from back when I was director of the games program at a competing school um, at Boston Polytechnic. And, um, we always had students come through looking at our program, and we said, well, where else are you looking? And they said, well, we're looking at RIT and RPI. <coughs> Those were the two, uh, the two other schools that students were always looking at. I'm sure you heard a similar thing when you had students coming through. Um, and um, uh, Andrew has a long list of things that, um, that he's done in the last, over the last decade, um, including starting up a games program from scratch starting out a research, um, so an outward-facing research lab from scratch. Um, he's currently president of the Higher Education Video Game Alliance, which is an international organization that works to promote um, games, video games programs um, around the world um, in things like advocacy um, and, um, I think it's him, not you. Ad advocacy um, and a better understanding of um, the um, strengths and weaknesses, I mean, the strengths of, of uh, teaching video games, um, and uh, video games is a, a discipline in general. Um, so, um, we look forward to this great talk. So, let's welcome Andy. All right. All right. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been a real thrill to be in this <laughs> See you, Dylan, and all of that. So, um, just want to say I'm very glad to have made the very long trip here uh, and enjoy all the all the wonderful things. Um, this is not a, like a typical like sort of one project research talk. I just tried to like cram everything in an overview so that folks could get a sense of who I am and what I do and how I think about things and all of that. So, without further ado, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up a gamer. Uh, I'm in that little slice of people that the Atari came out right when they were first exploring game machines. And so I watched the industry sort of explode at the same time that I was getting into it. And that's me in my Pac-Man shirt when I knocked all my teeth out on my bike. <laughs> uh, that is also me. That's the first thing I ever learned to program. It's a Texas instrument, something or other. Uh, and they had this little um, wire that you could plug in the back and get a text editor and start messing around with what was on the cartridge. So that was kind of fun. And I'm lucky to have made a bunch of stuff at RIT. Um, so I made the, the first graduate course in 2001 when I was doing that, and an undergraduate degree, and then a graduate degree, and, and so on down the line. Um, Rob mentioned some of those uh, in there. Uh, and when you start to put years on it, it gets really depressing uh, because it's just sort of this litany timeline, right? Of every couple of years, the university wants to expand and do something more, and uh, that kind of thing. So. What started as a course became a concentration, became a master's degree, became a bachelor's degree, became a department, became a school. We started offering minor, we um, lost our minds and moved the entire university from quarters to semesters. So we remade everything that we had made at that point. That was fun. Uh, and then uh, five years ago, we created the, the um, RIT Center for Media, Arts, Games, Interaction, Creativity, or MAGIC. Um, and uh, that's been my life for the last five years, is to build that center. Um, by the time I stepped away in July, that center had 34 affiliated faculty from four different colleges uh, across campus. Um, and we just built a $35 million facility with largely external funds um, to support that. So that's been my, I've actually been wearing a hard hat for the last uh, couple of years uh, in my job, which is strange. Um, and what I would say about all of that is that the um, way that we think about games in higher education is very different from the way that, that I first thought about games in higher education. So uh, when I started, I was looking around for who else was doing this, and I found six people in all of North America that were had something in their course to do with games, right? There was like John Laird in Michigan, and, um, you guys were sort of like dabbling in it, 
and um, there was some um, stuff out in North Texas with Eve Parberry and a few other folks, but there was not like this sustained games programs uh, in all these degrees. And I've been thinking a lot about my institution. So when we started, I had this one course and people would kind of go, oh, well, if you want to do games, talk to Andy. Like across the entire university of 20,000 students, like if you want to do game stuff, then just go talk to Andy because nobody else was really engaged and ingrained with what that looked like. And uh, I gave a presentation last year at GEC talking about games at RIT and what that looks like and what that means and where they sit curricularly. And I hadn't really done a lot of due diligence in terms of looking at what was happening with games outside of like my own stuff and my own research center and all that kind of stuff. So I sort of you know did this big call and said, you know, hey, if you're doing stuff in this, please let me know and what does this look like and talk to a bunch of students and look through our course catalogs again and all that kind of stuff. And I tried to map it out and I mapped it out and what's going on at RIT relative to games from my one single course 15 years ago uh, looks like that. So that's a little different now, right? So there's <coughs> folks in digital humanities that are doing stuff with games, and there's folks in science that are using you know, games for science education and simulation and that stuff. And there's folks in uh, film and animation and new media and individualized studies folks who are going crazy with games. And there's just all this activity around this new form of media that I think uh, 15 years ago didn't really uh, have the cultural cachet uh, in the same way, right? We thought of it as entertainment. It was a place that it was a thing you did after you ate pizza and plugged some quarters into a machine, but it wasn't important. And now it's becoming important, um, and people are starting to see the connections and the ways and means that those things are interesting as cultural artifacts, as ways to engage people in, uh, in knowledge acquisition, uh, and so forth. And so along the way, uh, I've built uh, a few games. Um, We'll talk about why we build things in a minute. Um, the first game that I that I did sort of really at scale when when Magic was starting up, I wanted to sort of prove the fact that we could make uh, very polished, very pretty things, uh, so that folks would know and understand the capabilities of the new center. And so one of the first things I did was I made this game. Um, this game is called Splatter Schmuck. Uh, splatter being the thing that happens to paint when you drop it and shmup being a contractualized form of shoot 'em up which was slang in the 1980s arcade games for uh, anything that you sort of ran around with a joystick and shot bullets in any direction. And it's a particular canonical form, uh, mostly out of Japan, although there was a big sort of uh, thing with it in the early 80s in the arcades. Uh, if you remember games like Ride In and stuff like that, that was kind of that thing. Um, so it's a really strange game. I made a game about painting. Uh, it is a game designed to teach people around, about gesturalized abstraction, which is an uh, art technique. It's uh, most popularly known by the artist Jackson Pollock, uh, as well as a few others. Um, and so it was really weird because I made a game. Uh, my students couldn't figure it out because we made it as a web page. So from a tech perspective, they were like, but that, that's not how you make a game. So that was, I was challenging their notions of what a game was. Uh, the campus couldn't figure it out because it was a game about art and art education, uh, and that wasn't what games were for. Uh, and it was a, a really interesting uh, piece of work because it sort of took everybody's understanding about what a game was and twisted it a little bit. Uh, and then we, we launched it, we released it, um, we put it all over the news, we advertised it uh, as best we can because we're a university, we don't really do marketing uh, aside from looking for students, but we try. Um, and I submitted it to a bunch of stuff and it got accepted in a bunch of places and we showed it at GLS, uh, where it was a finalist, we showed it at DIGRA, uh, and then its claim to fame is that I, I showed it at the Smithsonian. Um, so I got to stand in the Smithsonian American Museum of Art next to the real thing and call my mom and say, Mom, my game about painting is in the place where they show the paintings, right? I win. So that was, uh, that was very nice. Um, and these are some of the paintings that people have made with by playing the game. So you play the game and it makes this piece of art generatively as you play it, and then you get to keep the piece of art when you're done, and you can post it to Facebook or save it to your hard drive or whatever. Um, there's my class of, of undergrads that I made it with. Um, yeah, so it's a game about, about appreciating paint. Um, the next game I made was about campus politics. <laughs> Called hack slash and backstab. 
<laughs> and it is uh, an exploration of a broken reward mechanic. And so what often happens in, uh, in higher education in certain circles is we need people to work as a team, <coughs> and we uh, group them together as a team, and we make sure that they engage as a team, and that they have resourcing and support as a team, and then when it comes time to evaluate how well they do, we evaluate them individually. So Pack Slash and Backstep is a game where you need the other three players, it's a four player game, you need the other three players to help you get through this very difficult dungeon and you have to work together to defeat the enemies to get to the end and at the end, whoever walks out the door first wins. And so at a certain point, it's in your best interest right, to <coughs> stab the other guy in the back and sprint to the door. And where that occurs is sort of an interesting uh, dynamic. right? Uh, you can take a group of four people and put them on a couch and have them play this a couple of rounds and they start to hate each other. It's really interesting, right? And it was an exploration of things like group projects, staff ranking, uh, all of the things that we do sometimes when we have bad policy, uh, even though we might have good people. Uh, so it's sort of a, an exploration of that camp. Uh, we published it on Xbox. It was the first time a university in, in the U.S. had taken a student game directly and moved it through a publication process all the way through CERT and onto uh, a large commercial platform. So we got a lot of bragging rights out of that. Yeah, yes. Right? And there's me on the day that it launched in store. <laughs> ha -ha. Right? Our provost called me. He was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And I'm like, why is it cool? And he's like, I don't know, but it's really cool. <laughs> so it's sort of an interesting thing. Uh, we did a project with the Buffalo Bills uh, where we took 360 videos uh, and uh, stuffed them into the, in VR uh, so that folks could get the experience of what it's like to be a player uh, on game day. So you get to go through the locker room and the tunnel and all the places that you know fans are not allowed to go and sort of understand what that experience is and what it looks like. Uh, it's no real like big technology element to it, but it was a neat social uh, engineering piece uh, to sort of think that through. And I'm working on a game right now uh, called Fragile Equilibrium, which is an exploration of um, the way you feel squeezed uh, when, uh, if you um, deal with depression. So the idea is that the game is constantly scrolling at you from the right, as most scrolling shooters do. <coughs> While that is happening, anything that slips by you, um, as things often slip by you in, in life and in games, uh, will start breaking the other side of the screen, so it's eating back against you. And occasionally you have to turn around and deal with it, but when you turn around and deal with it as sort of an internal focus thing, you're not facing the external world, so it's an allegory of internal and external focus and what that looks like uh, and how to find a balance between those things uh, in order to be effective. It's going to be a nice little art game, I think. Um, so those are four things that we've made. The point is that we've made a ton and ton of stuff. Um, so 20 years uh, of doing this, um, learning through making, right? And the, I highlight that um, because the whole notion of learning through making is really the, the crux of the curricular design of the program and the focus of a lot of my work. So the, uh, the underpinnings of the curriculum that we were exploring were we were using things like um, uh, Seymour Papert and Mitch Resnick coming out of the Lifelong Kinder Group at Lifelong Kindergarten Group at the MIT Media Lab. Um, it's sort of formally rooted in constructionism and constructivism uh, as educational theory. Um, but you can sort of wrap your mind around that by just saying we, we learn by making things. When human beings make things, there's a lot of uh, learning that happens. Right? And all you need is a little kid and a bunch of Legos uh, to sort of understand what that looks like. Uh, there's some more of us. We have a little uh, thing about open source uh, in our in our lab, so we wow, it's pixelated on it. Anyway, um, so we did a uh, we we used to do a lot of these sort of um, maker weekends and and hackathons and game jams <coughs> and all this kind of stuff to sort of kickstart um, you know, people coming together and just spending some time and uh, creating some interesting startup ideas, and then we would take the ones that worked and sort of ramp them forward. Right. Um, so, so a little bit of culture and motivation, because games are cultural products, and some of my work is focused right now on the fact that, that they're um, resonant uh, or not with our culture. So that, that all happened at RIT. That was my piece of work. Um, 
It was one institution in upstate New York. Um, most Americans probably couldn't find it on a map uh, if you're out of the tri-state area. And that's just one little spot. And what's happened nationally, right, there are now 380 some odd games programs in North America. So where I could identify six people with courses, there are now 380 some odd programs in North America at various institutions, right? So the, the way that that has exploded is um, pretty incredible at scale. And so on the one hand, I might want to say that, you know, I think, uh, I think games education and research is pretty well supported by academia. It seems to be going pretty well, right? From zero to 300 and some odd, yeah, can't complain. I'm sure there's hits and misses in there, but whatever, right? Like, it, you know, as a curve, moving the right way. Um, well, so the other interesting thing about games is the way we think about them and what we think they're worth um, at the same time, right? And so in America, uh, we don't like to imagine that they're worth much of anything, even though they are, right? And so I've heard all of these things uh, as I was doing this work over the last 15 years, right? So uh, all children play violent video games, clearly true, right? Uh, all video games are violent, clearly true, right? so on and so forth, right? Uh, my personal favorite is that, you know, as, as just an afterthought, we're also to blame for the obesity epidemic, epidemic in North America. Just, just throwing that out there as like, you know, oh, and that's your fault too, right? Uh, kind of interesting. Uh, and there's a bunch of research on this. This is Dimitri Williams uh, talking about um, uh, you know, sort of, um, I think he called it the River City Hypothesis after the, the line in the play. But um, this is essentially saying that we do this with every new form of media, right? We need jerk against it. There's a generational divide. We um, don't know how to uh, properly incorporate it and think about it in its cultural context and its capabilities and possibilities. Uh, so we get afraid of it, uh, and then we start vilifying it. You know, so the River City hypothesis, the advent of a new medium will give rise to fears of displacement of constructive activities, right? We're playing video games instead of insert wholesome activity here, right? whatever that is, right? If they play video games, it's violent, but if they run around with sticks and stones in the woods, right? then so on and so forth, right? And um, so this whole notion, right, around what these things are and what they mean to society has been a big focus of what we were trying to do at Magic because um, we believe that games have an interactive capability to really transform the way that somebody thinks about something and the way that they experience something, uh, and that there's a little bit of magic in what happens with them because, uh, because they're interactive, right? You can try a bunch of stuff out and then uh, kind of understand what works and what doesn't, um, and understand uh, kind of the inner workings and totality of a system. So when you want to talk about systems-oriented education, uh, Systems-oriented thinking, uh, as it relates to education, games are a good tool, uh, sometimes in that context. And instead, uh, at least in America, um, we have this whole big hullabaloo over uh, something called the hot coffee mob in Grand Theft Auto. Um, and that was a, a really interesting, it made all the headlines, it was on CNN, it was you know, all over the place, right? And it was people arguing about you know, this video game and how um, the content was inappropriate for children and all this kind of stuff. And when it came out, the game uh, was rated um, M. And uh, when they finished with that controversy, it was rated uh, NC-17, or A, adults only. And the difference between those is one year. The whole thing was about whether or not a 17-year-old versus an 18-year-old should have access to this game. And I know a bunch of 17 and 18 year olds and they thought the whole thing was pretty ridiculous. Um, so it's just sort of an interesting, uh, from a policy perspective. And then I uh, had been working with the Higher Education Video Game Alliance. We, we founded it for a couple of years. Constance Steinkuhler, my colleague, was president for uh, the first three years. And uh, she wanted to step away because she was moving from Wisconsin to Irvine. I uh, wanted to focus on that and uh, asked me to, to step in as president. And I said, sure, you know, things seem to be going pretty smooth. It's not that bad a thing. And that was in November of uh, uh, two years ago. November a year, November a year ago. And uh, I had been president from, from basically Thanksgiving, uh, American Thanksgiving. And then it was the holidays and everything was fine. 
and I thought this can't be that bad. And we had a school shooting in Florida, and that guy started talking about video games, and that got really interesting really fast. Right? Um, because it doesn't matter what you say when you're, it doesn't matter whether it's true when you're the president of the United States when you say it, it will be repeated, it will be in the press, it will be remarked upon as if it is true, uh, at least to a certain extent. Um, and so that got called out um, as you know, the reason that Americans shoot each other is because they play these violent video games. And um, we started issuing statements that said things like, oh, actually, a lot of people play the violent video games, and only the Americans seem to shoot themselves. So uh, it's, from a research perspective, there seems to be some holes in this theory. Um, kind of interesting. So when I think about that educationally, I, I tend to harken it back to Gamergate. If you're not familiar with Gamergate, you should, you should know and understand what happened with Gamergate, because it was sort of the, the underpinnings and the seed launchings of where we find ourselves in political discourse right now on the internet, which is not a good thing. Um, and it was uh, a whole bunch of people sort of using uh, games culture as an exclusionary tactic to limit the voice uh, to challenge the voice of um, women, minorities, take your pick, uh, anybody that was not, you know, white, male, and kind of vulgar. So uh, what I think that means educationally is that, uh, and we saw this at RIT, um, we had a, we, we I think still do, but had a larger significant problem in that we would teach engineers, and we would teach engineers in such fashion that it wasn't integrating with the liberal arts with communications, with um, you know, social and psych and, and all of that kind of stuff. And you can come out of that and you can say, well, my job is to just create the platform. My job is to just create the tech and I'm not responsible for what people use it for. And then you're Mark Zuckerberg testing in front of Congress saying that basically that exact thing, right? And that's, um, we're having some societal issues with the way that that's playing out. So. Uh, this was a piece that I wrote about Gamergate a while back, but it, it kind of still resonates with all of the work that I'm doing in terms of advocacy and uh, political stuff. So maybe it's not all peaches and ice cream uh, in terms of how we think about games. Uh, there's, there's a lot of variability and a lot of nuance in, in what that stuff looks like. Uh, all right. So now I'm actually going to talk about um, change gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about um, given that background, uh, what do I think we can do? Like, what, what's interesting to me, and where is my research going, and that kind of stuff. So I'll start by looking um, back at the Magic Center and the things that we built there and why we built them that way. And uh, so far in this talk, I have not talked about any of these things. I've shown a couple of games that we built largely for entertainment, although somewhat in terms of social commentary. Um, <coughs> But I haven't talked about global warming, I haven't talked about healthcare, I haven't talked about you know, wealth distribution or government and policy or energy or nuclear weapons or uh, communications or the human genome project or any of that stuff. And I list those specifically because I've been to a game jam about those all in the last year. Right? So people are trying to figure out how to use this media form and how to use uh, interactive uh, multimedia systems more generally to explore these topics and to make advances um, both in the science of these themselves and also in the public understanding uh, around them. Right? And so um, I think that that is really the kind of the crux of um, what the university can do when it has a deep and divided interest in games. Right? Uh, because I think, again, this is a, a phrase that I stole from Ian Horswell at Northwestern, and I said it really well. I'm in your way, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's nowhere to like, stand in touch. Um, which is protecting making as a form of inquiry. So a lot of times in formal research, we forget that the actual act of making the thing right, is a lot of times where the learning happens. Right? And um, we kind of shifted that around and just said we learned by making things when we moved it into the Magic Center. and. Uh, we actually stuck it on the wall. That's a that's an architectural rendering of what the, the grand uh, thing looks like now when you walk in. The reason we made that center is that we looked around and we said, well, the platforms for a bunch of this stuff are converging. This was the president's um, president of RIT's uh, rationale for why he wanted a, a big research center in the space and why he wanted it outside of any of the individual programs or colleges. He wanted it at the university 
level. Um, because he looked around and he said, well, the, the stuff around tech and the technology around games and film and animation and interaction and VR and all this stuff, they're, they're kind of all slamming up against one another. They're becoming a kind of interchangeable suit, right? People are using, you know, game engines to make movies and they're making, <coughs> taking what they know about, you know, uh, movie cinef cinematography and trying to move it into 3D worlds and this and that and the other, right? So um, there's this convergence and so we wanted kind of a centralized clearinghouse and a way to, to interact across those disciplines. I looked at it and there was kind of a convergence of another sort, right? So we used to think of academics as being really over here. Right? We had a whole bunch of undergrads earning undergrad degrees and doing their thing. We had some grad students doing their things, and that was kind of research focused. Right? And then we had like a startup and entrepreneurship center like down the road. And at RIT, literally down the road. Like you had to get in your car and go over to the, to the startup place. Right? And we looked at that and we went, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Right? What can we do that, that actually starts to integrate across those things? Right? And then how do we uh, how do we combine that with R&D, and how do, we, how do we tell the world what we're doing, right? It's the last thing that a lot of people leave off when they make a research center, right? They're like, oh, we do great things in the research center. You should just show up and we'll show you, right? But there's never that outward face and push, right? And so what we did is, um, when I made Magic, I made, it, I made the research center, and right away we created Spell Studios, which was a, a little spin-off LLC, and its only job was to take the things that we thought were interesting, right? polish them up enough that they were like a really credible prototype that you could put in front of the public, right? and push them out the door and advertise them, right? market them. Right? Make sure that people knew what was happening and what we were doing. Uh, it was, we ran a whole bunch of stuff simultaneously. Um, we did a, a co-op program, which was basically getting students funding for early stage ideas and prototype work, and the bulk of that came from the National Science Foundation through a program called i um, which is a, a sort of uh, tech innovation development fund uh, within the states. Um, we got some from the Board of Trustees, we got some from the Business Center. Uh, we obviously did a bunch of grants with 34 faculty, you're gonna have you know, a bunch of grants kind of ebbing and flowing throughout that thing. Um, we did a bunch of academic projects. We did a bunch of not academic projects in terms of more commercially sorts of things. And I would classify uh, like the thing that we did with the Buffalo Bills. It wasn't really academic, right? We didn't learn any big new finding about 360 video. Um, but we got to play with an audience and, and look at you know, how things got disseminated at, at scale a little bit. Um, we had several different initiatives within that, so we sort of chopped up, like these were sort of people's individual labs within the center, more or less, so each one had a faculty member that was sort of their champion and, and that stuff. Uh, we had something around free and open source software, around uh, religion communication and policy, we had one around frameless labs, which is our, which is our VR thing, um, a few others. Uh, and then we got some really big grants to sort of help float the infrastructure of the thing, right? So we went to New York State, and we got identified as a uh, games hub for New York State, one of three. Uh, so that was a couple million uh, over three years, and then it would renew and renew and renew. Uh, and then we, uh, we basically went to the state and had a meeting with the governor and said, we can't continue to scale this work in the building that we have, because the building that we have is full uh, all the time. And we also don't have the capabilities and, and uh, technical capabilities for some of the work we want to do. Um, so he gave us a bunch of money and then we had to go out and do corporate matching. Because uh, in New York you can't take a dollar from the government if there's not a match fund from, uh, from private industry. So we did that and we raised 35 million and we made them. Uh, all of which I would say is that the end is for messy. Right? It's just, you know, we just got in the mode of not saying no to things, and we were just gonna like, you know, get on the ground and make it go for a little while, and then the things that stuck were the things that people really cared about and were passionate about, and the things that didn't you know, sort of floated off. Um, so this was kind of our poster of uh, come get involved, and there's a lot of things in there that are sort of traditional researchy center sorts of things, um, like faculty research and scholarship, and um, you know, infrastructure and uh, you know, speaker series and stuff like that. And then there's a lot of things that aren't, right? So we were providing front-end support for things like 
uh, IP policy and legal. And we would you know, meet with students, figure out where they were, and then drag them to, the, um, you know, to, to either general counsel uh, or to um, where else on campus would be useful. Right? So we were sort of interjecting ourselves to make it really simple uh, for folks to sort of figure out what they wanted to do, figure out what that looked like, and then how to scale that up. All right, so with all of that as a background, now you sort of hopefully have gotten to the point that I'm rather passionate about making things and about having other people make things. Um, and I think that that's kind of the, the future of how we think about, um, about higher education. Got there. Okay, everyone's nodding, so all right. It beat me over the head with it enough. Um, so now I'm starting to look really carefully at the way that people make things. And I tend to be a big process guy, and uh, I'm doing a lot of work right now specifically around um, what I would term development streaming. So if you don't know what development streaming is, development streaming is the act of streaming live um, the making of a thing, a game, a model, a painting, whatever. Um, but in my specific case, I'm looking at people doing game development streaming. And I think it's interesting for a number of reasons. So the first uh, slide that I'll show you is, is I stole from uh, my, my colleague, uh, Mia Gonzalo. Uh, so in, in 2006 and 2007, there was this thing called Justin TV. Uh, you probably have never heard of it because nobody really paid attention to it, uh, except for the folks that got really into streaming really early. And that was uh, rebranded as Twitch TV. They took their gaming section out of Justin TV and called it Twitch. Uh, in 2011, and a whole lot more people started paying attention to it because what was happening then was sort of the precursor to what we now know as esports, and people were starting to watch other people play games uh, as a form of entertainment. And Justin TV kind of shut down as Justin TV, it just stayed as Twitch, uh, and then that sold to Amazon for $970 million, and Amazon scaled it through the roof, and it is now the third slide is old. It is now the third largest driver of internet traffic in North America. So that's kind of a big thing. And it's all people watching other people do stuff, whatever it is. It's a very strange phenomenon. Right? Culturally, it's just weird, right? I'm going to turn on the television and I'm going to watch this guy cook dinner. It's kind of a strange thing. Why would you ever want to do that? What's going on there? Right? And I started to think about that, and I started to think about, in particular, development streaming for game developers and development streaming for artists. And artists are particularly unique in the way that they tend to make stuff. So back when I was making that Splatter up game that I showed you before, uh, I got to take it um, out to, it was still in development, and I took it out to a conference and um, showed it off, and I showed it off to these two guys in the bar after the conference, which was way more meaningful than showing it off at the conference. And those two guys, uh, so this guy in the gray is Michael Goh, and at the time Michael Goh was the Senior Vice President for Experience Design and Creativity at Adobe. So he kind of knows a thing or two about artists and the way they work and digital tools to help promote the creative process and so on. The guy next to him is Jeff Dowd. Jeff Dowd was the uh, principal designer in residence at Adobe. And we had this big, long discussion about what it means to learn to draw, why you want to learn to draw, and how you go about it, what are the stages, what are, what are the sort of cognitive touch points, and all that kind of stuff. And Michael was doing a, a series of pieces around this, uh, and it was really pretty interesting. And if you've ever, uh, so drawing is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, so first off, um, you've all known little kids, right? All little kids draw, almost universally. Right? There are some cultural aberrations in particular, in, in particular areas, but um, by and large, at least in Western countries, all little kids draw. And just as interestingly, they all think they're good at it. You ask a three-year-old if they're good at drawing. Yeah. Right? This is good. Put it on the fridge. Right? And we all do it. And what's interesting about that is over time, weird things start to happen. So when you first start to learn to draw, it's all about the kinematic movement. Right? It's all about this. Right? 
I'm learning to control my hand is what this is really about, but I'm gonna you know, scribble and so on and so forth, right? And then you move through a process where you start to say, well, I'm gonna draw a particular thing, right? I'm gonna draw Santa Claus, or I'm gonna draw, you know, whatever, right? And then you start to uh, you start to refine that thing, you start to add color, you start to think about you know, differentiating color, you start to um, more accurately depict individual objects, you start to fixate on particular features. Uh, long about somewhere between 10 and 13, you start to really get a hankering for perspective, and so on and so forth, right? So like, there's this whole body of literature around what this stuff looks like, right? And the way that somebody sort of moves through the process and learns to draw. Just as interestingly, right, things start to go a little south. Right? So there's this wonderful story that Michael told uh, around nice sheep. So imagine you're a little kid and you're drawing this drawing and you're working on this big puffy cloud and it's this big cloud and kind of a blue green sky and you're excited about this and this is great and whatever. And the adult in your life, you know, maybe your mom or your teacher or somebody comes along and goes, nice sheep. <laughs> So there's this role that happens when somebody else comments on work and what that means and whether or not that resonates with your creative vision for it, right? Right if you watch. Leave, it, leave, leave the windows the way they are. I just opened them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're fighting. Nice window. <laughs> you know. um, so what I think is interesting about that, right, is that when you watch most teenagers draw, they will almost universally cover their paper. And so we get into this culture of saying, well, I'm going to do my work and I'm going to create my thing privately and then show my thing and get feedback on my thing publicly, right? And a whole bunch of art is around critique culture and what that looks like. And we do the same thing in games education, right? We say, we're going to make a game, it's going to do these things, blah, 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 blah. You go away and build it, right? I'll teach you a little bit of you know, how to use Unity or whatever, but you go away and build it and make your thing and then come back. And when you come back, Right? We'll look at the thing you made, and we'll use that to discern right, whether or not you mastered that material in terms of being able to do it, in terms of you know, understanding the, the competencies involved, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But we don't actually watch them make the game. And what I think is kind of interesting about that is why not? Right? If people are streaming the act of doing development, why aren't we watching them make the game? Right? What would that look like as an educational process? How would that change the way we think about teaching? How would that change the way we think about engineering education in general, right? or art education, or some amalgamation of the two? Right? And it's different in different contexts. Right? If I'm going to teach you to throw clay, I'm going to stand there while you do it. I'm going to watch you do it. And I'm going to look at where your fingers are and where they mess up in this stuff. And then we're going to have a whole discussion about you know, this and all that kind of stuff, right? But we don't do that when we teach technology. At best, we sort of get in front of somebody and say, well, it works like this. Watch me do it. Blah, blah, blah. Here's the thing. Now you try it. Right? And then we're on to the next person because you know, we have a whole bunch of people in the classroom and so on. So I'm kind of particularly interested First, in terms of this, this cultural identity of saying, why are these people streaming this in the first place? Right? What about it? And when you explore that and unpack that a little bit, the, one of the things that you hear a lot is you hear people saying, I need a way to commit myself to this process. I need a way to make sure that I'm going to do this every day, I'm going to get up, I'm going to stream it, and even if nobody watches it, I don't care who watches it, right? I just want kind of a touchstone of forcing myself as a practice, right? What you don't hear, what I'm starting to think about, right, is being able to say, all right, did this development stream, right, and I'm doing this thing every day, and now I can use it as a reflective way to go back and explore what I'm doing. Right? So to what extent is it useful in your own work be able to say, oh, you know what? When I sit down and work, I actually spend one third of my time right, struggling with this one thing, or what have you. Right? So, to what extent does that work? Right. So, the commitment to process, the cultural identity. The next is a community of peers. Right? 
Right? So most of the folks that are streaming game development are also watching other people that are streaming game development. And they're starting to talk to one another, where are you stuck, and what does this look like, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm pretty sure my students at RIT, when I say, read this chapter and do this thing so that you understand how the game engine works, um, some of them walk out of that lab and go, I want to know how to do, and then copy them doing it, and then that's how I'm going to learn. So kind of understanding that. Um, the big one, I think, that's here is the reason I had all of that stuff in there about you know, Donald Trump and all of that crazy stuff around games is that the public understanding of games is still very divided, is still very mythological, is still very based on narratives, not fact. Right? We still think of you know, lonely guys that sit in the basement and eat pizza and Mountain Dew, and that's who plays games. Right? Demographics of that are not correct. Right? If we actually look at who plays games and when and where and all that kind of stuff, and we can because they're tech systems, uh, it's way more diverse than that, and there's lots of different kinds of games, and so on and so forth. Right? But part of that comes from the fact that I think um, people don't know how games are made. They don't know what they are. Right? So in the States, uh, in, in the tri-state region in the north, um, a few years ago there was a, a, one of those surveys where they just ask a bunch of kids, you know, like, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? And uh, right behind professional sports, game designer was number two. Number two. They put that in common, we beat astronaut, right? Like, think about when you're, you know, fifth grade, right? What do you want to be when you grow up, right? <coughs> like, you know, fireman, astronaut, you know? play for the Yankees, you know, whatever, right? Like, there's no rule set around that, and yet game designer is number two. Next question is, what does that person do? Nobody has any idea. Because where we have a cultural understanding of what a movie is, right? Oh, there's some actors, and there's a script, and somebody films it with a camera, and then you see it in the theater. And that's grossly oversimplified, and anyone that works in film is like, you know, rolling their eyes so hard that they're going to injure themselves, right? But at least the general public has some gestalt around what a movie is, right? When you talk to them about games, they say things like, somebody has an idea for a game, something happens on a computer, and there's a game. Like, there's no awareness of what that process looks like. And so another thing that I think is interesting about game streaming is that you're starting to see a generation of people that are uh, going to know more about how games get made, because they can just go out and watch someone make one, which was never available before. Right? At best, you could get a very heavily redacted market interview with somebody in like Game Developer Magazine, right? that they've, you know, the, the marketing department has made sure that there's no real meat in half of that content. Right? But when you're 11 and you want to say, I want to make games, right? Where do you go to understand what that means? Right. And now it's starting to, starting to be there. Um, it's also a place where you can start to scale. right? So you can say, well, you know, I'm getting better at making games. I know these things. Um, I'm going to look for the person now that knows more than me. And on the internet, there's always the person that knows more than me. Right? So how do you cascade forward right? and continue to engage yourself in that? Um, I think this idea around a support network for people that are struggling to make their first thing is really important. Uh, but also this idea of societal and social critique, right? So you make, it, you make your first game, you put it on the internet, and somebody says, my sheep, right? Um, so what does that mean, right? And how do we make that a positive learning environment versus, you know, the tragedy of the commons? What does that look like? Um, and there's like a thousand more things in there. I'm just starting to really sort of unpack what this looks like. Um, but I'm sort of in my mind thinking of it as like the quintessential and forever take your kid to work day for any field anywhere at any time. And what does that mean? Um, I also think it's going to be like not very long before people start streaming this. You know, like right now it's like you get a little tripod and you put it next to your computer and you. You know, people can see either you or your screen, or you and your screen, or you and your screen, and you have a little chat window where you can talk to people. And some people have um, 
you know, they've used like you know voice assist so that so that the chat will talk to them and they can talk back to it, so they're gonna <coughs> whatever and all this kind of stuff, right? But like the technological mediation of what this is just gonna ramp through the roof, right? Like somebody's gonna start streaming in VR, somebody's gonna start streaming in 360 if they haven't already. Um, somebody's going to start streaming, you know, off of their AR glasses, right? You know, watch me grocery shop or whatever crazy thing, right? Um, I was telling some folks the other day that I um, just read a thing about this uh, kid that was uh, watching people stream farming because he lived in Brooklyn and he will probably never see a farm. Right? And what's interesting about all of those things is that there is right now this cultural thing that's happening where there is this quest for authenticity. Right? You could watch a documentary about farming. Right? There's lots of them. Right? But that's not the same thing as watching a normal, non-actor person just farm. Right? So people want this realism for some reason. Right? There's distrust of the packaged, uh, mediated form. Right? Uh, so what does that look like? It also means that it's really inefficient, right? Because you're just watching it happen, right? So it's like, how do I get to the interesting part? Right? Uh, so you know, there's a, like a community of people that really watch it live and engage with the chat, and then there's a community of people that watch the stream after the fact so that they can scrub it, and all that kind of stuff. So that's uh, kind of what I'm doing in my research now is looking um, very critically at that, uh, trying to understand what's happening and trying to think about how those tools. Um, what they mean in terms of understanding development and what they mean in terms of understanding education um, because I think that there are uh, some big interesting things that we could start to think about when we shift this notion away from just go away, do your thing, and then I'm going to evaluate you through the thing that you made um, and more directly in understanding um, the creative process that someone is using to arrive um, directly at that work. Uh, if you really are, if you think that's interesting too, um, started to write about it. Um, we're doing a, a workshop at, um, at NCA, uh, National Communication Association, in October. Um, we have a paper in uh, the Hicks Conference in Hawaii in January. Um, and uh, I'll be presenting, um, doing a little workshop in the, in the uh, start of Kai Play um, in Melbourne in not very long, uh, end of this month. It is October, right? Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, and then there's some other stuff about like the game and the learning pedagogy uh, that we're doing with Meaningful Play and so on. And what I would say about this work is um, I'm obviously pretty pretty excited about it. Um, it's kind of fun. Um, but mostly I'm excited to work with the co-authors that are on this stuff. Um, so Mia Consalvo is one of my co-authors. Uh, she is the only tier one um, Canadian research chair in games. Um, so she's like, you know, a real powerhouse when it comes to the communication and sociology <coughs> aspects. Um, and then uh, Adrian Decker uh, is the outgoing chair of SIGSI, so the computer science education group for ACM, um, and is ingrained in kind of all of that stuff. And then uh, Chris Eggert is the uh, guy that I work with most closely at RIT. Um, he was my associate director for the Magic Center, and we co-founded the degrees together. Uh, and he's basically the tech wizard that figures out all the underlying make it work bits. Um, yeah. If you want to see my stuff, um, I have a little website. It lives there. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I have email. Um, you know, check it out if you're so inclined. Uh, and with that, uh, thanks for having me. Um, super excited to be here. Have to answer questions and we'll just chat generally. Uh, and this is a little bit of the work that I've done uh, while I've been here, just trying to capture the environment of what these things look like. So, little daily watercolors of bits of museum. Ta da! We have time for questions? <coughs> yes. Andy, the, um, the issue of the, the gamers and the DNC thing is interesting. I mean, the psychic. Uh, Elvis appeared on Ed Sullivan and there was a yep. moral panic. Yep. Uh, Tipper Gore at the Senate subcommittee mm -hmm. with Public Enemy Street of Compton putting explicit lyrics and trying to ban it and then having explicit lyrics figures. I mean, it's a, it's a wave. How long will the wave last in terms of this association between gaming and DNC? When in fact, we know that most of the um, terrible events that happen in America are basically the old right being agitated. 
and <laughs> kids being agitated by whole right messaging as opposed to yeah. gaming. How long will it take before that kind of narrative is corrected? Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, right, um, it's generational, right? So it'll phase out because, you know, when, when my generation is now the, you know, probably the, you know, the predominant, you know, um, retiree generation, that to some extent that'll be problem solved, right? Because if you grew up on that media and you know and understand it, although there is kind of this weird outtick where um, folks become more conservative as they age, right? And so sometimes new content can challenge, can challenge that. Um, it will kind of always rise and fall, right? I mean, we still see it in rock music occasionally, even though rock music has, you know, by and large been here long enough that folks are like, you know, no, sunscreen the records is not really the answer. Um, you know, sort of thing. Um, you know, so I would hesitate to say, you know, in exactly, you know, 12 years, right, like it's done. Um, I think there are things that are starting to break down, right? And so in this latest thing uh, with, with Trump and the, the school shooting and all of that, right, um, we issued a bunch of statements um, out of HEFCA, um, uh, a couple of other academic organizations issued statements, and we were just saying, look, the science does not say what you're saying, right? Here's all this work by Chris Ferguson and, and a thousand other people, right, saying, you know, playing a, a first-person shooter does not make you a serial killer, right? Like, this is just, you know, whatever. Um, but I think what was more interesting was the, the cultural backlash. Um, the popular press really got on it, and mostly got on it in a good way. I mean, Fox News is always going to do what they, what they tell them to do, right? I mean, it's a propaganda channel at this point. But uh, all the other major news outlets ran a story that, that basically said, this is not a thing. This is an NRA strategy. This is a talking point. It's an engineered talking point. Um, and that culturally within the United States, that was one of the first times that that really happened, right? Because I remember like when it came up with Nancy Reagan, when it came up with Hillary Clinton, when it came up with, um, I forget the one before Nancy Reagan, right? Like then the press was sort of willing to just go along with, you know, oh, games are bad, like, you know, da 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 da, da right? And, and this was the first time it was really sort of a, you know, wait a minute, like you're, you know, you're just saying this because it's politically expedient to you. Right, um, so that gives me some hope that it is starting to to wane. Um, you know, that said, somebody's going to make you know somebody's going to make some piece of interactive content that's you know off the scales in terms of you know ridiculous violence because they will. I mean, human beings are going to make a range of things, um, and that will reignite it to some extent and, and so forth. But I think generation generationally, right? I mean, we don't argue about ragtime music anymore. So it's just going to continue to evolve. Are, are developers streaming? Um, so you use artists as, a, uh, as your example. Um, but a developer sitting there coding something up yep. and um, yeah. pushing out that. They're sitting there coding. Uh, the good one, the ones that I think are good, the ones that I like to watch, are the ones that talk out loud, right? Like, trying to make it so that you know this thing does exhibits this behavior, right? And then you, you, know, you watch that loop, right? I'm trying it, and I click the run button, and I go, well, that's not exactly what I wanted. And then I go back, and I fill with it a little more, and you know that kind of stuff. And so where I think that gets really interesting is when they're talking out loud, right? So they're basically coding for the talk aloud. And then uh, other people are starting to comment in the chat, like, you know, well, have you tried this? Well, have you thought about this? You know, like when I face that situation, blah, 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 right? So you're basically looking at sort of a virtual distribution of like, you know, the old paired programming models, right? Um, so the way that that, that stuff um, can impact uh, somebody's learning process. I think we don't, we don't really have a good handle on it yet. There aren't very many people looking at it, um, but it's pretty interesting to me, right? Because um, I struggled the first time to learn to code, right? And then, uh, I know a lot of other people do too, right? A lot of other people, it's like, oh, I games, that's super exciting. You try to teach them to code, and it's like, what? Um, so as a way to sort of culturally help people slop over that barrier, I think it's a pretty interesting space. But does the, um, does the coding community care about intellectual property as such? I mean, if somebody's creating a game, would you think there could be some commercial value in it? 
sharing it in an open media is somewhat fraught, I would have thought, but does that, does that have much of a kind of interest? Not really. <coughs> yeah, not really. I mean, these guys are, are from what I've seen, um, and I'm speaking generally here because you know, I haven't done an ethnographic study of every streamer, but um, they're mostly hobbyists, they're mostly indie, um, and they're also, you know, a weird thing happens in that space where it's not AAA, right? Which is that by and large, nobody else has the resources to recreate the IP that, that you're working on, right? So if you're working on something and you've got a year sunk into it, right, and you're streaming it, it's not like somebody can, you know, pick it up and, you know, make it tomorrow, right? Without a whole bunch of resources that they probably don't have. Um, I think there's, pro I think too, you know, the, the interesting thing from a legal perspective there would be, you know, because these are streamed and captured, you've got a database of you building the thing, right? So if somebody does come along and go, you know, thank you very much, and that makes your thing, right? You could be like, well, that, that's my thing, right? It's kind of documented to be my thing, because, you know, whatever. Whether or not that would stand up, I have no idea. I mean, that's just kind of an interesting, um, hasn't, hasn't happened yet, it hasn't gone there yet, right? Probably will. Um, could be interesting, right? Uh, what you don't see is you don't see a lot of large-scale um, commercial work doing this for, for the obvious reason, right? Yeah. You know, you're not going to get, you know, <coughs> watch Bungie make Halo, right? Like, it's just not, that's not a thing. Um, but what they are starting to do is they're starting to think about, um, I guess, sort of like, you know, boutique um, design cult experiences, right? So like, you know, watch John Carmack code for a day, right? Or, you know, whatever, um, where they're using that as sort of a marketing and cultural capital um, piece um, to engage people with product and with brand and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Any other questions? I'll go one more. Yes. <laughs> the commercial part of that, it's that piece of magic that you created, uh, the piece to get IP to the point where you can push it out, the magic um, spell. Yep. So is that intended to be both student and academic output? Yeah. Doesn't care? It doesn't care. No. Um, sometimes it was, you know, students made a thing and they want to put it on the storefront and, you know, see what happens to it and that stuff, but they don't want to take the risk of making their own LLC and, you know, being responsible for it and that kind of thing. So we would. And then you would do that as a brokerage service, so you would yeah. get the yeah. there's fees are tracked to associated with it, but the, the, you know, there's a share of benefit kind of around. Yeah, I think I think we said um, we would take ten cents on the dollar yeah. to cover costs. Yeah. Um, you know, we weren't looking, and and we made it really clear like we are just barely covering costs here. Yeah. Like we're not we're not in it to make money off student projects, right? Um, you know, mostly to cover the, the transaction fee of them actually sending us a check. <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, the, we also did it for faculty um, in a couple of instances, and that was, that was way more fun uh, for me, because um, that really challenged the sort of colloquial thinking around um, inventor clauses in, in intellectual property within the institution, right? And it, it basically, it was a pretty interesting sell because we had a group of faculty that really wanted to make stuff, wanted to make stuff and get it out to the public, wanted to make stuff and even sell it, right? But they just, had no interest in being personally entrepreneurial, right? They are just like, I don't want to run a company, I don't want to deal with it, I don't want to file my taxes four times a year, I just, like, I want, I want none of it, right? I want to sit in my studio and make my thing, or I want to, you know, work with my team and create my, my game. Um, and so, you know, for them, it was really kind of a, an interesting um, thing because they're kind of, you know, they're losing, a little bit of autonomy, um, but they're gaining a service, right, embedded in the place that they already are, uh, that they can use to help reach an audience that otherwise they would probably never reach. It's kind of an interesting thing. Okay. All right, let's start Andy. Thanks very much. Yeah. And uh, Mel has organized um, 